Earlier today, the NCAA announced that it was launching an investigation into Michigan's football program on grounds that they allegedly have been stealing signs and play-calling signals from other players over the past two seasons. There's a lot more into that topic, and I will link an article from ESPN, one from 24-7 Sports, and one from Yahoo Sports, where the original article originated from, down below, so that you all can check out that topic and read into it. But we're focusing on the game at hand here between Michigan and Michigan State. Michigan State and future opponents of Michigan were notified that Michigan likely already knows their plays and their signals, whether they do or actually don't, will be determined by the NCAA's investigation. Michigan State reportedly was allowed a way out of this game, and to their credit, they ended up declining that out. So this game is still going on. I think all of this stuff is bizarre and mostly ridiculous. Um, if there was already evidence that Michigan did in fact cheat, why not just bring it out right now? And if there isn't any evidence, just allegations, why are you telling other universities that Michigan already knows your play calls and giving them an opt-out opportunity for games? But I digress. I'm going to try and put that behind me. Michigan and Michigan State, thank goodness that game is still going on at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time this Saturday. Is this a matchup that is of top 25 caliber? No. Is this a matchup that is going to be amongst one of the most watched or most exciting games? No. Is there a likelihood of an upset here? Is this a trap game for the number two Michigan Wolverines? No. In fact, I would argue that there is a great possibility that these allegations being released today, and I said this in my live stream earlier when reacting to the news, that this will only make Michigan's team even angrier and more motivated than they already are to win the Big Ten and win a national championship. But Michigan State has had a habit, whether it's 2016, whether it's 2018, whether it's 2020, where despite being a anywhere from average at best to one of the worst football teams in the country, punching above their weight class. That is a Michigan State thing to do. That is a staple of the Spartan program, is punching above their weight class. And with Harlan Barnett being a Michigan State Spartan alum, I know that he knows that. He embodies that. He's done a great job of, I think, taking the Spartan locker room through the healing process and holding the team together. When it comes to in-game coaching, Rutgers disaster, Iowa disaster, I, I don't think being a CEO is Harlan Barnett's strong suit. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. But you have to appreciate that he was willing to step in and, I'm not going to lie, essentially take a bullet for the entire football team with how the whole Mel Tucker debacle went down. Man, Michigan... Michigan State, what is it with investigations and reports of wrongdoing? I have no clue, but these players and the fans deserve a great game. For Michigan State, I hope their next head coach is a great hire. And for Michigan, obviously being a Michigan fan myself, I hope that Michigan hasn't done any kind of wrongdoing. If they have, I hope they quickly get rid of it, do better, and move on. I just, can we can we focus on college football, I guess? Um, the Michigan Wolverines are 7-0. Michigan State is 2-4. They won their first two games of the year and are on an 0-4 stretch. But crazy things happen, and some of the craziest things I've ever seen, like, whoa, he has trouble with the snap have happened in the battle for the Paul Bunyan Trophy. Welcome back, fellow football fanatics. It's your host, College Football with Sam. And today we are going to be talking about the annual Michigan versus Michigan State game. This game takes place in East Lansing, in Spartan Stadium. And I've considered going this entire week. I don't think I will. But nonetheless, it will be a great game to watch. 
And with the history of this rivalry, despite the fact that Michigan on paper looks like the far superior team, I am nervous and I am second guessing my team when it comes to this matchup, just given the history of the Spartans. Before we get any further into this preview and prediction segment, please subscribe to the channel by clicking that big red subscribe button, hitting the notification bell so you won't miss when I release more Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State, Penn State, Nebraska, and Big Ten football content. I'm going to try and get two or three preview and prediction videos done tomorrow, but I would say just bet on two, maybe one. We're not finished this week, so if you want to get notified when I release more videos, hit the notification bell. Comment your own prediction for this game along with your thoughts and analysis on both teams, how you think their postseasons after 2023 and preseasons entering 2024 will look. Given Michigan State needs to hire a new head coach, a lot of people are speculating that if the NCAA and Michigan continue to battle it out in a battle royale fashion, that Jim Harbaugh might leave for the NFL. That, I would say, is probably more legitimate than his previous NFL rumors, given the stuff that's happening right now. So let me know what you think about these two programs and about your prediction for this game. And lastly, check out my Patreon page via the link in the description so that you can support the channel. And more importantly, depending on your tier, get insider bonus content specifically for game predictions against the spread money line using my power index. Thank you so much for listening, and let's get back to it. Um, just to be frank, this matchup on paper is a nightmare for Michigan State. And Mike Valeni in the preseason, well-known Spartan radio host, is the best in his business in my mind. I enjoy listening to him. He said in the preseason that you know Michigan fans should not attend this game because it's at night. Spartan Stadium is going to be jam-packed. The fan base is going to be angry, potentially violent. And he did he really did say that, but I'm paraphrasing here. And it would just be a toxic environment. Well, now, Valenti has announced that he is an Oregon State fan for the rest of the year. And that Michigan fans should go to this game. Because from here on out, Michigan has you know, Michigan State, then they have Purdue, then they have road games against Penn State and Maryland. And then Ohio State. Michigan State might be the easiest remaining opponent on Michigan's schedule. So in Valeni's mind, if you want a, a big-time win against a rival, go to Spartan Stadium. And looking at things on paper, I can't necessarily disagree with him. I mean, the state of Michigan State football right now is at an all-time low. Like 2020, 2016, all-time low. Uh, they're two and four out of 69 power five teams. I think Michigan state is the 57th best power five team in the big 10. They're the 12th best team. I think in potential power only ahead of Northwestern and in Indiana, which is just pretty sad. And they're well behind everyone else in the big 10 East, whether it's Maryland Rutgers, Penn state, Michigan, Ohio state, obviously, Michigan's number one in potential power. Ohio State's two. Penn State is seventh. Maryland and Rutgers are top 30 in potential power. State's all the way outside of the top 50. And potential power's prediction, factoring in home field advantages, Michigan winning by 52 points. They should win by seven or maybe a little more touchdowns factoring in home field advantage. Um, potential power, again, doesn't really factor in garbage time. It assumes that all teams are going to be playing as hard as they can for four quarters, which means it can't predict when teams are going to put in their backups. It sort of always assumes that teams will run up the score, basically is what potential power assumes. So that looks, from my view, like a lopsided prediction but it's understandable given the fact that Michigan is favored by 24 points um, when it comes to the Vegas spread. And a lot of people are talking about how that is a low number given what Michigan has done to Nebraska and Minnesota and Indiana. And Michigan beat Rutgers at home by 24. And even though Michigan State, they blew that game against Rutgers. They led by 18 
They had over a 95% chance to win according to FPI win probability in like the early fourth quarter, late third quarter, and they blew it. Rutgers, to a certain degree, had their own down game. Um, Their defense typically is known to be stout, and they let Michigan State pass on them, run on them, and it really took Michigan State having the worst special teams performance of the week and having several fumbles to give Rutgers back the game. It was not an impressive performance by Rutgers. In fact, I would say Rutgers played a worse game against Michigan State than they did against Wisconsin or Michigan or several other of their games against, let's say, you know, Temple or Wagner or Virginia Tech or Northwestern. But a win for Rutgers is a win. Now, they're playing Indiana this weekend. This isn't a Rutgers preview and prediction segment, but they'll probably beat Indiana, and they might get a seventh win as well. So Rutgers is likely going bowling. Um, All that to say that, just to reinforce what I was talking about earlier, that Michigan State is not a good team. Um, This is not, you know, typical Michigan State's underrated or they've had several close losses, or this is a down year like in 2016, but they still have a head coach who knows how to beat Michigan and play him close. Mel Tucker's gone. The players have faced back-to-back games where they have literally choked the lead away, which is very demoralizing. That Washington and Maryland game is probably still ringing in the back of their mind. And Jay Johnson and Scotty Hazelton just don't know how to call a good game. And Harlan Barnett, I think good father figure. I admire his character. I think he has better character probably than a lot of college football head coaches. Because some would argue that it takes somewhat of a insane person or someone who's willing to bend the rules to coach at the college ranks. And I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that. When it comes to being a schemer, a CEO, uh, a trained organizer, someone who can call a game correctly, who can step in, who can lead a team to victory, who can give the give their team that extra ability to punch up from their weight class. Harlan Barnett doesn't have that. And honestly, neither does Mark D'Antonio. I thought D'Antonio coming back might help the team still, you know, be at somewhat of a serviceable level. Still go, you know, six and six, five and seven, maybe four and eight. This team honestly looks like they're going, you know, two and ten is what it looks like for Michigan State right now. Two and ten, three and nine, four and eight at this point would be downright miraculous. Because after Michigan, they have Minnesota, they have Nebraska, they play Indiana, they play Penn State. And some other teams that Michigan State plays, I, I'm trying I'm trying to think through all these things here. They already played Rutgers. Oh, yes, they have Ohio State. So that's a daunting schedule for Michigan State for the rest of the season. Um, and a win here from Michigan State would be momentous. It would be everything of a revenge win. And it would show that this team is still motivated. It also would kind of be a very shocking moment if Michigan State even competed in this game or won because they haven't, they weren't competing against Washington. They couldn't finish against their previous three opponents. And you have to think if this team is just downright broken entering this game. Meanwhile, Michigan, even with this game being played in Spartan Stadium and Michigan when facing Any state team with a pulse in Spartan Stadium typically struggles or it's a dogfight. The circumstances this year are different. Like I mentioned, interim head coach, a team that cannot finish, a team that looks bad defensively, bad on offense. Uh, Noah Kim has been benched in favor of Kaden Hauser, which I think is a good move by Michigan State staff. And Michigan, I think, is the best team in all of college football. I released my... Um, top 10 video this morning. Check that out if you haven't already. I'll link that in the descriptions. So there'll be a lot of links for you guys to check out in this video's description. Please do. Michigan's number one, and for very good reason. They're the most efficient team in college football right now. They assassinate you. And to go back to, you know, the stealing signals, 
that could play into how they assassinate teams. But also, I've watched Michigan for the past three years. They bully you. Michigan will sometimes call the simplest plays, or they will call plays that you watch be executed and you're nervous because you see that the opposing defense or offense, if you know one of their players does X, that's a blown up play. But then Michigan out executes their opponent and that turns into, you know, 60 yard touchdown by Donovan Edwards against Penn State or an 85 yard touchdown against Ohio State by Donovan Edwards, where he broke a tackle. If Ohio State had gap integrity, that would have been, you know, a two, one, three yard gain. He picks up the first down, Michigan wins anyway, but that long touchdown to seal the deal probably doesn't occur. Um, Michigan has transformed over the past two seasons. They really, really have. And they have one of the best coaching staffs in the country. They have one of the best rosters in the country. They have a great quarterback in J.J. McCarthy, who slowly but surely looks like he could be a generational type of talent. I need to see him perform against the Kalen Kings and the Denzel Burks and the Josh Proctors and the Keaton Ellis's of the world. So, McCarthy, please play well against Penn State and Ohio State. But... Um, right now, he's number one in QBR. So, a, a deep contrast of teams. This is still a rivalry, but that's really the only thread that Michigan State can hang on to. It, and that's even including home field advantages, that this is a rivalry game. Because the fan base seems disengaged, the coaching staff seems as inept as ever, and the team... I feel bad for Michigan State players. I don't know how you mentally survive those games against Iowa and Rutgers, where right now you could be 4-2. You could very easily be 4-2. My conversation and my approach to this game would be different if Michigan State was 4-2, because they would have won you know, two road games against Iowa, against Rutgers. They'd have some momentum entering this game. There would be still something to fight for, you know, to get to a bowl game. Or for Harlan Barnett. Harlan Barnett right now probably knows he's not going to be the head coach at Michigan State. Meanwhile, if Michigan State's 2-2, two and two, he knows that he has a shot if he can pull off this upset. But 87% of you picked Michigan to win, which was, was almost 2,500 people. Almost 400 people picked Michigan State to win, which was 13%. I do these weekly polls every week for games that I am thinking about previewing and predicting in my community section, and I allow you all to vote who you think is going to win, and your vote counts, your vote matters, so make sure to hit that notification bell again and subscribe if you want your own vote to be featured in my preview and prediction matchup. So a lot of people are picking Michigan to win here, however there is that sizable chunk, whether it's Spartan fans, nervous Michigan fans, I imagine it's a healthy balance of Spartan fans who are mad and Michigan fans who are nervous. Meanwhile, those picking Michigan is probably most people, along with Spartan fans who've either given up on the season or who are pretty reasonable, I would say. Uh, Michigan should win this game, and you see that in the position advantages. Michigan, the only area where the Spartans are statistically more impressive than them is special teams. And after last week's performance against Rutgers and the performances against Iowa, I'm not buying that the Spartans have a superior special teams unit to Michigan. Part of the reason I think Michigan's special teams unit is not rated highly is because they haven't had to rely on special teams this year compared to previous seasons. Jake Moody, um, he helped Michigan win many games in 2021 and 2022. He helped give Michigan some momentum entering the halftime against TCU in 2022 with his long field goals. He was the reason Michigan beat Illinois in 2022. He helped Michigan several times in 2021. Michigan in 2021, Michigan State beat them 37 to 33. They kicked four field goals. Moody was an All-American in 2021. Um, and James Turner has come in, and James Turner's a good kicker. He's not an elite kicker, though, like Moody was. But Michigan's red zone efficiency has been off the charts compared to previous seasons. They've had no problem punching in the football in the red zone. 
and Michigan has not had to punt much, if at all. And Tommy Doman, much like James Turner, he's a good, great special teams player. Not elite, but he's good. And Jake Thaw, and it's not Roman Wilson returning punts, but it's I not Ty, is it Tyler Morris? I think it's Tyler Morris or I'm pretty sure it's Tyler Morris back there returning punts, but mainly Jake Thaw. Michigan has a good set of they have a good set of punt returners who rarely muff, know how to catch, they know how to get return yards, and their special teams unit has been improving throughout the season. Everywhere else you cannot compare. Michigan is better by a mile. On staff, Michigan is one of the better head coaches in all of college football in Jim Harbaugh. They have one of the best defensive coordinators in the nation in Jesse Minter, who right now leads the nation's number one scoring defense, only allowing 6.7 points per game. And on offense, Sharon Moore, with that offensive line, with his play calling, and with Mike Hart coaching the running backs, that's an elite offensive staff as well. So Michigan staff is one of the best in the country. Michigan State staff, you have Scotty Hazleton, you have Jay Johnson, who still enjoys calling shotgun runs on fourth and one. Get him out of there. And Harlan Barnett and Mark D'Antonio, you know, great, great contributors to Michigan State football in one way or another, but right now their job is more focused on, at this point, probably keeping players from entering the transfer portal and just maintaining a good reputation, helping these kids get through this tough year rather than winning football games. For quarterback, Michigan has J.J. McCarthy, who's passed for 1,512 yards, 14 touchdowns, 3 interceptions. McCarthy is a 195.9 passer rating, He's completing 78.2% of his passes, and he's averaging 10.6 yards per pass attempt. Expect to see plenty, I think, if Michigan wins this game. They're like they're going to win big. If Michigan State is playing close, um, there's a good chance they end up winning, just because it's very hard for anyone or me to see the Spartans be competitive in this for longer than a quarter or two. Jack Tuttle... 11 pass attempts on the season. Jaden Denegal, three passing attempts on the season. It wouldn't surprise me if Michigan has a lot of backup quarterback play in this game. But nonetheless, you cannot overlook Michigan State here because they have Nathan Carter and they have Caden Hauser, and they do have some receivers like Monterey Foster Jr., Trey Mosley, Jaron Glover, Christian, and Christian Fitzpatrick, along with Tyrell Henry. Michigan State has an underrated wide receiver core, I think that Courtney Hawkins is the best assistant coach by a mile on the staff right now, and I think you see that in his position group. The problem is Noah Kim was never able to get those receivers the football. He wasn't. Noah Kim can't function under pressure, and even when the offensive line protected him, his arm talent was horrific, to be quite frank. After winning the Big Ten Offensive Player of the Week award against Richmond, you know what happens? down the drain, and Keaton Hauser is now the starter. 27 completions, 45 passing attempts for 291 yards. Hauser's averaging 6.5 yards per pass attempt. He's completing 60% of his passes. Two passing touchdowns, one interception. He's been sacked four times. He has a 124.5 passer rating, and Hauser has a 66.9 quarterback efficiency rating, which is... Com- is much better compared to Noah Kim's 42.1 quarterback efficiency rating. I think Caden Hauser, at this point, play him play him for the rest of the season. He had two touchdowns, no interceptions against Rutgers, and completed 62% of his passes. He only had 133 passing yards. He also had 21 yards rushing with one touchdown and got sacked twice. And Rutgers, along with, you know, Michigan... Ohio State, Penn State, those are tough defenses that he is going to be facing, but I'm curious what he'll do, let's say, against Indiana or a Minnesota defense that has struggled, but Michigan State is facing a plethora of tough defenses and also offenses this year. I said in the preseason, I think Michigan State has the toughest schedule in all of college football with how good 
Washington looks, Michigan looks, Penn State looks better than I expected. Ohio State looks a, a little worse, but they're still an elite team. And then Rutgers is better. Maryland's better. Nebraska has, you know, they're probably going to go six and six, seven and five. Maybe they can go eight and four with, you know, Wisconsin falling off. They have a really tough schedule, the Spartans do. So Hauser, for sure, I think, gives the Spartans their best chance to win. Nathan Carter's still averaging 4.7 yards per carry despite playing behind a mediocre O-line and against some of the country's and conference's best defenses. He has four rushing touchdowns, 529 rushing yards, and 113 carries. Pardon me. Carter is one of the better backs in the Big Ten, in my mind. 5'10", 200 pounds. I love him as a player. I'm a great guy. Um, the problem with him is he's not Kenneth Walker, and even if Kenneth Walker was on this team, Michigan State might have won another game. But this team is so, I cannot exaggerate this. They are so bad, especially when it comes to in-game coaching and management. Um, Nathan Carter, if you're Michigan State, you better hope that the next coach does everything that he can to keep Carter in East Lansing. Because next year, if Michigan State's offensive line improves, maybe they, you know, maybe they hire. Um, Val, you know, Valenti always has been saying ever since Tucker got fired, that the Spartans should hire a head coach who can also bring in a transfer quarterback. Maybe with a better quarterback and a good coach who knows how to build an offense and an offensive line, Nathan Carter could, you know, thrive. And I think he would thrive in the right circumstances. I thought he was going to hit close to 1,000 rushing yards this year in rotation with Jalen Berger. But then again, I was higher on the Spartans in the preseason than I should have been. But Michigan State is skill players, and at wide receiver, they have Monterey Foster Jr., Trey Mosley, Jaron Glover. Trey Mosley is two receiving touchdowns, same with Tyrell Henry. Foster Jr. is 274 receiving yards and a receiving touchdown. Mosley has 228 receiving yards. The Spartans have spread the ball around the field quite a bit. Malik Carr, 169 yards, one receiving touchdown and 17 receptions. He's been having a down year. And I don't know if any of you noticed this, but I think Malik Carr, in my opinion, looks looks somewhat sloppy. I'm not going to lie. Uh, Michigan State is a decent center in Nick Samak, but the rest of their offensive line has performed at a better level than last year. I'd say similar to a 2021 O-line level. The problem is they do not have the same quarterback play, the same receiver play, and definitely not the same running back play, and they don't have the same play defensively. Plus, they're without their main head coach, who they trained with and practiced under and were led by for the entire preseason. So there's a lot that's discombobulated with the Spartans this year. For the Wolverines, we've talked about the Spartans mostly here in this segment, but it's because I want to highlight some names that I know a lot of others are not highlighting. On defense for Spart the Spartans, I would say look at their defensive line. I think the Spartans still have a stout defensive line, and Michigan, who likes to run the football, if they can you know, bother J.J. McCarthy or slow down the run game, that would be their path to victory. Um, McCarthy has been very efficient through the air. He's been slinging it around, but I'm curious to see how he does if, you know, he needs to pass for 30 or 40 times in a game to win big or come out with a win. I don't think Michigan State's secondary or defense will be able to hold up much against Michigan's offense, but it's just something to look out for because you never know. Blake Corum is 546 rushing yards and 12 rushing touchdowns, and he's averaging 5.7 yards per rush. And then his backup, Donovan Edwards, has 197 rushing yards. He's averaging 3.3 yards per rush, one rushing touchdown. Edwards is a running back who I could see breaking out in this game. I could see him breaking off a few big runs once he gets past that first line of defense. As Michigan State on defense has had a bad habit of tackling with their bodies. Um, arm tackling isn't the greatest, but often Michigan State tries to tackle their opponents by hitting them. They don't actually tackle them. And I think with the, the physical athletic players that Michigan has, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, 
if a lot of Michigan players get big gains, they have you know sprints to the end zone, whether that's Edwards, whether that's Kalel Mullings, maybe J.J. McCarthy gets a 50-yard scramble. Who knows at this point? And Roman Wilson, 396 receiving yards, nine receiving touchdowns. He's a player to look out for, along with Cornelius Johnson, Colston Loveland, and Donovan Edwards through the air. Defensively, Michigan has 18 sacks, nine interceptions, three pick sixes. They have seven forced fumbles. This defense is much better than it was last year, even better. Michigan's defense every year has gotten better. It's absolutely phenomenal. I know I've spent so much time talking about the different positions, but in 2021, the defense was near elite, but it had a problem stopping the run, and the defensive tackle room was overrated for the talent that was there. In 2022, the defense got better. There was still some vulnerability in run defense, but Mozzie Smith was a much better player than Christopher Hinton, for example. And the secondary also had better players. DJ Turner was more mature. Mike Sane was still made his transition from wide receiver to nose back in the 2022 preseason. The defense really had one off game. That was against it was against TCU. And there was another game against Illinois and also Purdue where the defense was able to get pushed around a lot, but Illinois didn't have the firepower to punch it in on every drive, and Purdue didn't have the explosiveness or I would say the mobility or quarterback play to make plays in the red zone. TCU had both. Very explosive offense, but also a methodical offense, and one that had physicality. That That's, that's where TCU got Michigan last year, was they had physicality, they had toughness, much like Illinois, and I would say even like Purdue. They also had the schematics, like Purdue did, and like Ohio State did. And they had that speed, athleticism, and finesse that Ohio State did. They, ha- they had the best of all the worlds on offense. Their only limit offensively was Max Duggan's ceiling and overall the really the talent ceiling on that offense because they didn't have five stars who were developed, littered everywhere. But anyway, and then this year, this defense right now looks like the best in America by a mile. But I don't think... And by a mile, I mean from what we can tell right now. I think there's an argument to be had that Ohio State and Penn State have better defense than Michigan. But what Michigan's doing by holding opponents to the lowest points per play nationally and Michigan only allowing 6.7 points per game, that's crazy. Um, Michigan at the end of the season might hold, on average, opponents to single digits offensively. That would be crazy. And right now, outside of some big plays in the secondary that have been allowed, which are very hit and miss, this is not a consistent issue, the defense has no weaknesses. However, I think a player to watch for Michigan is Roman Wilson. And for Michigan State, it's Caton Hauser. If State is to win this game or be competitive, it's through Hauser. It's through him hitting Henry, hitting Glover, hitting Mosley, you know, getting the ball to Malik Carr, getting the ball to Monterey Foster Jr., completing handoffs to completing handoffs to Nathan Carter, occasionally taking the ball on his own. Just really for Caton Hauser, go out there and have fun and be confident, and you'll probably play your best game. Because this defense is elite that you're facing, but you do have playmakers at wide receiver. Your offensive line is better than the one that Thorne had to deal with last season, and you have a better running back. I mean, State this year, you look at how they're performing this year even, they probably are a more talented team than they were last year. A healthier team, a deeper team, a stronger team. The problem is... They are they're without a CEO entirely. They are entirely without a CEO right now, and they're being managed by coordinators that somehow get worse every single season. But for Hauser, he impressed against Rutgers, and Rutgers has 
one of the better safety rooms in all of college football. They have one of the better secondaries in all of college football. And Greg Schiano, I think, is going to go bowling this year. And I think it's clear that Rutgers is finally beginning to turn a corner in in their program history. Greg Schiano's second stint, I thought, had a big risk of being a failure after last year. Well, my mind is slowly changing on that, but I'll have to see how Rutgers performs against Indiana this weekend, of course. For Roman Wilson, nine receiving touchdowns. We know this. And he's a great playmaker. I think he's tied nationally for first place in receiving touchdowns, because nine receiving touchdowns is a lot. He's averaging 15.8 yards per reception, He almost has 400 receiving yards. This is through seven games. Roman Wilson, if he has some big games against Penn State or Ohio State, or maybe even here against Michigan State, has a chance to reach 1,000 receiving yards. At this point, he'll probably finish with around 800 or 900, maybe 1,000 if Michigan, you know, reaches the national championship game and wins the Big Ten. But I think Michigan's key to beating Michigan State which that which maximizes their chance of success is attacking through the air. I know for Michigan State, I said their key to victory was stopping Michigan's ground game. That's how little faith I have in their secondary. I think, I I think if Michigan's passing attack doesn't do well, it's because of Michigan State's defensive line or because of Michigan's own lack of preparedness. Michigan State's secondary is once again among the worst in all of college football. So, Roman Wilson, make the great catches that you've been making all year. Run your routes to one of the faster wide receivers in the Big Ten. And with your speed and your ability to slice and dice defenses, McCarthy and yourself should have a career day. For Caton Hauser, make the right reads. Have fun. Don't put the entire game on your shoulders even though that might be the key to winning. But just go out there and with your receivers and with your offensive line and also with Nathan Carter. Minnesota was able to run on Michigan early in the game. Rutgers with their quarterback and and with Gavin Wimsatt, they were able to use quarterback runs on Michigan and have some success. So let's see if Michigan State can get a few drives on the Wolverines. I, I think they can. I think they do have some untapped offensive firepower that could maybe test this Michigan defense. However, all in all, look, Michigan State has been down back-to-back games, and really for four games in a row, they have just looked like one of the worst teams in all of college football. And that's too bad, because I thought that they were going to go 7-5 and five in the regular season, maybe 8-4, and four, maybe 6-6, six and six, but I thought they were going to improve off of last year in record and the eye test. Even in games against Iowa and Rutgers where they could have won, and if they were 4-2 and two and they had achieved those victories, let me tell you right now, they would look better than last year's team via the eye test, and statistically, they blew those games away in a fashion that last year's team could only dream of doing. That loss against Rutgers and against Iowa, that was last year's game against Indiana-level type of stuff, but in back-to-back games. That's absolutely horrible. Michigan State is outmatched, and they will likely give up, and they might score on a trick play. In fact, I think they will likely score on a trick play or maybe a drive that likely will have Nathan Carter punched in the end zone. However, I think the Wolverines are going to unleash their anger on Michigan State with 450 or more total yards, probably a defensive score. I think the stadium will be half full of maize and blue. This is Michigan's, I'd say, easiest or second easiest game for the rest of the season. Ohio State will be the toughest. Penn State will be the second toughest. Penn State with the opportunity to be Michigan's toughest opponent if they beat the Buckeyes. Maryland will be third. It's between Purdue and Michigan State for who's the easiest and most likely win on Michigan's remaining schedule. With how busted the Spartans are, but with also Purdue's injuries, that's a tough draw. So let me know down below who you think is an easier opponent for Michigan, either Michigan State or Purdue. Michigan wins big 56-7 to with that and also some of my other predictions for this week. Michigan would continue to look like college football's best team. 
Georgia is on a bye. Ohio State plays Penn State, and unless they beat Penn State by, you know, three touchdowns in dominant fashion with an efficient offense, Michigan probably still comes out looking like the better team and performing like the better team and executing better than the Buckeyes. Unless Penn State wins, Michigan will be ahead of them. And the rest of the Big Ten outside of Penn State and Ohio State and Michigan, it's those three and then a a drop off of a cliff after that in the Big Ten. I'm so excited for Washington, Oregon, UCLA, and USC to join the conference next season because that will be so much more fun and there will be a lot more competition there. There won't just be one tier of the haves and then the other tier of 11 teams that are the have-nots because I think that Oregon, Washington, and USC, depending on how their programs operate, how Lincoln Riley addresses the Alex Grinch problem and how quickly Oregon and Washington can reload— Those teams, I think, can contend for a Big Ten championship. So that's all I have to say in this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I want to give a shout-out to my patrons, Spencer Bringhurst and Noah DDLC, my All-Americans, and Will Loftus, Gabriel Callender, Roaming Gnome, and Matthew Sale, my All-Conference patrons. Have a great day, guys, and I will see you around. Please check out my Patreon page via the link down in the description. Like this video and subscribe to the channel. Have a great day, guys.